Heavenly Father, today as we open our Bibles, as we think of who you are, as we uh, receive a message that you've designed and called us for so long ago, may we have open hearts, may we have open minds, may you push the Forest Lake Church forward on your mission. In Jesus' name, amen. I grew up in the corner of East Tennessee, right up in the corner of it. I've talked to you about this before. Uh, it's the farmland of Tennessee. It's everything slows way down. Even the language slows way down. Let me tell you what, there's tractors on the roads. You got to watch out. It's, it's just beautiful country up there, and it's a wonderful place to live and grow up. And I got the opportunity to work on a farm. One of the uh, uh, church members in the Greenville Church was a nurse anesthetist, and he had a farm. He had uh, Morgan horses, and he had beefalo cattle, and he had guinea fowl, and he had chickens, and he had goats. He had all sorts of animals, and it was my job to work at his farm. He would hire young bucks like me, 7th, 8th graders, ninth graders, to come and work for him and learn the, the value of work and have a good work ethic. And I did all sorts of stuff. Anything that happens on a farm, I've done it. I've built barns. I've fixed fences. I've collected chicken eggs. I've, you name it, I've done it. But the worst job on a farm is not mucking out the stalls. I've done that many, many times, too many times. The worst job happens in the middle of the summer. It's 110 degrees outside, and the, the hay out in the field gets cut, and then it gets baled into square bales of hay. You know, they're about three foot long and 18 inches wide and 18 inches tall, and when that grass is wet, those bales are well over 100 pounds. And Jim, the nurse anesthetist, he said, all right, Matt, you're going to experience something today. And he got four or five other guys, and he said, it's time to collect the hay, put it on the trailer, and take it to the barn. So we all gathered around. We got his red Chevy pickup truck hitched up with the fifth wheel flatbed trailer. And we took it down to the field. Now the day before, someone had cut and baled the hay. And so there was neat rows of hay bales every 20 feet or so. And he lined that truck up. Somebody, it was never me, the lucky one, got to drive the truck while everyone else was working. And they got in there and they started driving down the middle of the row and uh, you'd grab a bale and you'd, you'd bump it up onto the trailer. Now that first tier was easy because it was only about chest high. And you could just kind of pop the bale up there and uh, the, the next row was harder. Jim liked to go five tiers high with his hay. So that top tier, I mean, I was 150 pounds soaking wet at this point. That top tier to get that hay bale up there, you got to get your leg behind it and pop that thing up so that the guy on top can grab it and pull it up there. And at the end of the day, your arms are all chewed up from the straw poking into your skin. You got rashes, you're sweaty, it's miserable. And the only good thing about this job was that at the end of the day, you could go swimming in his cold swimming pool. Now, every year something happened. He told the same story over and over again. Now, let's be honest. I don't know if this story is even true, but this is what he told me every year. And if you knew Jim Kennedy, you know he likes to tell stories, and there's a lot of truth mixed in with a lot of fallacy, too. So here's the story. He would say, Matt, let me tell you, one year I had to do this job all by myself. Yeah, right. He said, here's what I did. Nobody would come help me. And so I, I got my truck and I hitched it up to the trailer and I went down to the field and I put it into low drive, four wheel drive low. And I set the truck straight down the aisle and I jumped out of the truck and I ran back. I started throwing hay bales onto the trailer and then I went up and I adjusted the steering wheel and then I ran, went back and threw some more hay bales on there. He said it took him 12 hours when really it took, takes about three to four hours. Now I don't know if this story is true at all. But he makes a really good point because the point of his story is simple. He had a plentiful harvest, but the laborers were few. You know, Jesus says the same thing 2,000 years before Jim Kennedy. And we look at that passage today, and if you've got your Bible, I invite you to open it to Luke chapter 10, where we see Jesus' words as he talks about this harvest. Luke chapter 10 if you didn't bring a Bible, there's a blue book in front of you, and you can follow along on page 734, and you'll read the same words I'm reading. Luke chapter 10. Let me give you a little context. Jesus' ministry is in full force. He's already uh, been with the 12 disciples. They are, ha, are watching him, learning how to do ministry. He's called them. He's anointed them. He's equipped them, and he sent them out, the 12 disciples. They're out. They're healing the sick. They're casting out demons. 
And among uh, the, the people that he's with, he has a few different side conversations before this passage happens. Like the time he's walking down this road and a guy comes up to him and the guy says, I'll follow you wherever you wanna go. And Jesus says, okay, follow me. But the man tells Jesus that he has to go bury his father first. He says, I wanna follow you, I really do. But I gotta take care of this family matter. It's very important. My, my dad died and, and I wanna bury him. And it's almost, it almost feels insensitive Yet I think you can sense the weight of Jesus calling for us to be on his mission as Jesus says, let the dead bury their own, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another story before this, another guy comes up and he says, Lord, I will follow you wherever, but first let me go back and, and tell my family goodbye. And so Jesus, again, seemingly being insensitive, yet he's just showing the weight of being on the mission. He says, nobody that puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service for the kingdom of God. And as I hear these stories leading up to the passage that I read today, uh, my heart feels heavy because I wonder what are the excuses or the reasons that I have or that you have for not being out on God's mission right now? Uh, why do we have other priorities in life that trump the kingdom of God and for being on his mission? What are those reasons for you? So finally, as, as the 12 have been out 12 disciples have been out doing ministry and they've been on the mission and they've been sharing the message. They've been moving forward. Jesus calls 72 others. Some Bibles say 70. 70 or 72 others that are ready to be the church and ready to be the message and they're ready to be the movement. And we pick up in Luke chapter 10, reading the first two verses and the first word of verse 13. Here's what it says. Luke 10, verse 1. After this... The Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And the first word of verse 3 simply says, what does your Bible say? I couldn't hear you. What does it say? Go. That's what it says. Now, uh, there's lots of different points we could bring out in this short little passage, these two and a half verses, but I've got five of them that I want to point out today, and then we're going to do some application here. The first one is this. We'll put them on the screen. Jesus needed more laborers. He had the 12. They'd watched him. They'd seen how ministry worked. They'd watched Jesus do uh, healing and demon possession, casting out of, uh, demons out. He, they'd watched it all, but now Jesus equips them, and they have the power to do it. And I can only imagine these 12 disciples. They've watched it being modeled, and now they have the power, and they do it themselves. And they go out, and they preach the gospel wholeheartedly. Uh, they, with every part of their being, they're spreading the gospel. They're healing people. They're healing blind people and lame people. And they're moving through throughout the, the countryside and the kingdom of heaven is being preached, but 12 people weren't enough. And so Jesus gets 70 more people to go. And as I think about our context now, Jesus still needs more people than the 12. Or in our context, very specifically, we have paid professionals, don't we? In fact, this church is blessed to have 11 paid professionals to lead ministry, but it's not enough if it's only left up to the pastors of the church, then the job doesn't get done. Now, I know that everybody's in a different place uh, on the mission of God. Some, some people are, are more consumers, but some people are also very mission-minded. In fact, I hear the stories of many of you that are so active in mission that you see the mission of God as number one in your life. So your, your job, your occupation, that's so you can reach people. Your neighbors, that's so you can reach people. The passions in your heart, that's so you can reach people. And I praise the Lord for you. But we need more. Jesus needed more, and he still needs more. He needs you too. Here's the second point. We're rapid fire, these five points. Jesus sent them out in front. Now, this is a little weird to me. Sometimes I feel like uh, we wait for the Holy Spirit to prime somebody's heart and then we go, and he does that. But in this story, Jesus sends the people out in front almost like he's the evangelist, like we are the pre-work, we're the John the Baptist for Jesus to make connections, build relationships, and then as Jesus comes in, they see who God really is and how much he loves and cares for them. Moving forward, here's the next one. Jesus sent them out two by two. This one makes me feel good. Doesn't it feel lonely sometimes uh, when you're out on your own? Sometimes it feels like mission is only uh, just you and nobody else, yet Jesus sends them out 
two by two. He doesn't say, okay, you're ready to be the church? Well, you're on your own, good luck. He says, no, go together. Go two by two, go as a team, go as a church family, go do ministry together. That's us too. Here's the next one. Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful. Do you believe the harvest is plentiful today? I'm going to ask you again. Do do you believe that the harvest is plentiful today? I do too. Uh, Back then, Jesus said, people are ready. The field is ready. It's ripe. Go pick. And I feel like it's even more ripe today. In fact, I think of all the people in Apopka, Florida, a town that is hustling and bustling, a place filled with people that need to know the God that I know too. Here's the last point. Jesus told them to go. Jesus didn't need more people to do church. He didn't need more people to come to church. He didn't need more people to talk about church. He needed people to be the church and go from the church into the field to get the harvest. In our context, it's the same thing. God needs workers, but uh, workers in the field. The field's out there. It's not in here. It's when we go outside the four walls of our church that you find the harvest. It's the only way to get the harvest is to be in the field. Let's go out there. See, as we change culture, as we, as we change the mindset of what church is, we have to keep it continually in front of us. And as the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us, he leads us to some uncomfortable situations. That's what happens when you follow God. He leads you and puts you in uncomfortable situations where you have to trust him for him to carry through. In fact, I believe that God doesn't ever want us to be comfortable. He wants us to be on the move and to be active and growing. He wants us to be uncomfortable to the place where we have to trust that he's in control. See, for years, God's been pushing me to be more uncomfortable. I'm not afraid to talk to people. Uh, but he sure has pushed me to be more and more uncomfortable in life, given me opportunities, given me situations where I have to do something that is uncomfortable. Several years ago, I was driving on a Sabbath afternoon with Jan and the boys, driving in our minivan, and it was a blazing hot summer day, uh, just miserable outside. And as we were driving along, we saw a homeless man just on the, on the, on the sidewalk, We'd seen him many times. It doesn't matter how hot it gets, this guy wears a leather army bomber jacket and a full backpack on his back. That sounds miserable. That's what he always wears. But as we drove by him, we looked and we saw his feet and we could see his toes poking out the end of his shoes. And as we drove by, the whole family knew what we had to do. We had to get that guy some new shoes. And so we pulled over into the parking lot. I think it was in a a parking lot of a floor and decor. And we saw him walking. He was moving. He was walking up the street and he was turning the corner. And so we went through the parking lot trying to catch up to him. We ended up in the parking lot of a Burger King. And I jumped out of the car like a wild man. And I raced up this grassy hill to where there's a guardrail and the sidewalk is on the other side. And so I'm standing in knee high grass on a slope. And this guy walks up and I say, hey, fella, it's just a weird situation, right? Here I am thinking I'm going to help this guy. I'm going to bless him. Might even take a selfie with him and post it on Facebook so everyone knows I'm a great guy. Isn't that what we do though? So he, he walks up and, and I say, hey man, I, I can see your, sh- your toes poking out of your shoes. Can I get you some new shoes? And he says, no, I've, I've got new shoes. They're attached to my backpack. And he turns his backpack, the brand new pair of shoes on his backpack. I'm wondering, what, like, why doesn't he have them on his feet? And so I, I say, are they the right size? Do they fit you? And he says, yeah, they're fine. It's just an awkward, uncomfortable situation, right? So I can't help him in the shoe department. So I say, hey, man, like, like, are you hungry? Can we go to Burger King and I'll buy you a meal? And he says, no, man, I'm full. It's uncomfortable. It's awkward. Why is God allowing me to experience this? And I wonder if he puts us in some uncomfortable situations to get us out of our comfort zone so that we can rely more and more on God. I, I totally believe that the devil has done his best work to make the church feel comfortable, where we have an inward-focused gaze so that it becomes weird and awkward when we go out and be the church and connect with others. And I believe that churches have to get uncomfortable in order to understand the calling of being a disciple to be outward-focused and to be the church. Many years ago, I went on vacation to Jack's Beach, Florida. 
Jen's parents had a condo right there on the beach for a, a while, and we loved going there. And I remember one afternoon I needed to go to Target to get something. And uh, Target is just past TPC Sawgrass up there in Jacksonville. If you golfers, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, so I drove the car to Target, and as I pull into the parking lot, I see a handwritten sign. It has nothing to do with Target at all. And it just says, prayer tent, and there's an arrow. Oh, I'm a pastor. I'm thinking, what is this cool thing? So I, I follow the arrow, and it takes me to another sign. Prayer tent this way. So I drive this way. Prayer tent that way. And I wind my way all the way throughout this parking lot until I, at the very end, sure enough, there's a prayer tent. It's a pop-up tent right in the middle of the parking lot with a one single dude there in a chair. He's just sitting there. Well, I didn't want him to pray for me, of course. I'm a pastor, right? So I just parked my car, and I just watched. And every two or three or four minutes, a car would drive up pull up right to the tent. They just stop and they roll their window down. And this guy would hop out of his chair and he'd walk over and he'd lean on the window sill there and the, the, on the door. And he would just, you could see him talking to them, talking about their life, asking them what they needed prayed for. And, and they would share. And then you'd see him close his eyes and bow his head and he'd pray for them. And then they'd drive off and two or three minutes later, somebody else would pull up. They, they might park and get out and they'd walk over to him. And there for hours he would stay praying for people. Can you imagine the uncomfortable conversations he had? Can you imagine the people that don't know God that, that have been hurt and they blame God driving by and say, who are you even praying to? Does he even exist? This single guy sitting out here underneath this tent, but he understands the value of being the movement that moves forward that even if it's uncomfortable, he'll do it anyway for the sake of the mission. It's powerful when you see the church move forward. There's power when the church focuses on being the church. And when the church leaves the building, it becomes an unstoppable force for the kingdom. I want to give you a personal example of a church on the move, and then I want to give you an opportunity to be the church today. About 10 years ago, I got to pastor the Buford Family Seventh-day Adventist Church. It was a really cool church. It started out with uh, 58 church members. I was their first pastor. It was a lay-led church, and the church grew like wildfire, and they knew their calling to be part of the movement, moving the message, moving the mission forward. And we did all sorts of c community service and connecting with people, but, but one Sabbath, uh, we decided to do this. I think it's a pretty cool outreach opportunity. And so I had 50 t-shirts made, 50 t-shirts, black t-shirts, and it had incorrect grammar on the front of it. Somebody showed me after I had them all printed, and it simply said in big white letters, can I pray for you? And I, I invited the church family to join me that afternoon to go to a little place called Little Mulberry Park, beautiful little park with a 2.2 mile paved trail going around the lake. There's, people would run there and walk there and fish there. And, and so I said, hey, let's show up. 70 people came. It was half the church showed up for this event, this project, this outreach pro project. And they came, so 50 people put the shirts on, everybody else looked weird. But uh, when you put this t-shirt on, you feel incredibly uncomfortable because you are now a walking billboard. Everybody knows what you're doing. Here's what we looked like. Here's just a few of us. Look at these guys. Can I pray for you? May I pray for you next time. We'll do better next time. We put these shirts on, and it was funny to see the terror in the church members' eyes. What do you want us to do, Pastor Matt? Are you serious? We have to talk to people? Real? You want me to pray with people? I only pray before my food. What am I going to say? I said, guys, let's go out two by two, just like Jesus did. And so we, get, we split up into groups, and I got to go with that guy on the right. His name's Scott. He, went, he was the head deacon of the church, a great man of God. And, and so the two of us went, and he was so uncomfortable. And we, we, we'd walk down the trail. And, and the best part about it is you didn't even have to say anything to, to, to have a conversation with somebody. All you had to do was, huh? Huh? People would walk up to you, and, and you just... Uh, talk to them. Say, hey, we're here praying with people. How can we pray for you? What's on your heart? What's going on in your life? And how can we minister to you? We'd pray with them. We'd go to the next one. And two by two, we'd go in. One person would be praying, God, show us the right person. Help us make connections with people that need you the most. Went throughout the whole park. Uh, it was cool. You saw the Buford family the, on a, in, in motion. It was movement. The church was in action, moving along. 
We got to the, an hour later after we finished, we all gathered together and I saw this one guy standing over to the side. Here's a picture of him right here. Oh, sorry, this is one of, our, one of the church members just praying with some moms. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. This guy right here in the middle, I uh, saw this guy and he was just standing there with his arms folded watching us as we were packing things up. And, and so I, I went over to him and I said, hey man, do you need prayer too? Like, tell me what we can do, how we can pray for you. And he said, who are you guys? What church does this? I told him who we were. and He couldn't believe that a church would do something like that, that they were on the movement like that. When the church becomes more than a worship service and becomes people on the move, crazy things happen. And when God's power and the movement of his people combine, it becomes unstoppable. And so today I've got something for you. Tracy Holland knows this because she saw me yesterday. I've got something to help push our church forward on the movement. Yesterday, Jen and I went to Costco and we picked up 500 of Costco's best roses. They're beautiful, all sorts of different colors. It worked out very well for me because Jen went with me. We got one of those flatbed carts. You know the ones where uh, the moms go and they buy like a year's worth of toilet paper. Some of you are here this morning. You know exactly who you are. We, we took this flatbed over to the floral department and uh, we, we pulled off 21 packs of 24 flowers. We, I had buckets and we filled, it was this beautiful bouquet all on this flatbed and, and all the guys in Costco were thinking that I was getting Jen an early Valentine's Day present. In fact, at one point I said, happy Valentine's Day, babe. We checked out and uh, today they are here not for you, but for you to take to somebody else. Uh, I hope you heard me, fellas. These are not to take home and give to your wife. These are not to take home and put in a vase so you, for you to look at. These are intentional to give to somebody. You might have a relationship with them, or you might not. It might be a friend, a neighbor. It might be a complete stranger. It doesn't matter because the point of this is to push our church forward on the movement to be outward focused. So you got to think about who you're going to give it to. Some of you, you might take uh, one or two. Uh, I plan on taking two if there's, any, if there's two left. And uh, one is for my neighbor, Emily. She lives across the street, and I've been building a relationship with her for the last two years, helping her during hurricanes and texting her and just becoming a friend with her. The other one is for my other neighbors, uh, Matt and Melanie. They're my new neighbors, and I want to give these flowers to them. But uh, you, might, you might take two or three. You might take 10, I don't know. You, some of you might go down to Crane's Roost Park and walk around this afternoon and just give these to people. Uh, I've, I even made it easier for you. You don't even have to have a huge conversation. There's a little card out there and some, some twine. Uh, you'll wanna just take the stuff and, and do it later, but the little card just says, just showing God's love with people we love, Forest Lake Church. Tie it around a rose, just hand it to somebody. Just say, hey, God loves you, I wanted to give this to you, here you go. That's all you gotta do. Uh, whatever comfort level you have, make it uncomfortable so that you can do something and be on the movement. You might be nervous about doing something like this, but I wanna give you some courage, and it's right here as Jesus sends out the 70. Because they come back after they've been on his mission, and when they come back, here's what they say. Verse 17 says this. The 72 returned with joy, not discomfort, not nervous anxiety. They returned with joy and they said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. When the church is on the move with the Holy Spirit next to you, it becomes unstoppable. And as we today do something, whatever that looks like in your context, I believe God's gonna do something powerful for you too. I wanna to leave you with just these encouraging quotes from one of my favorite books of all time. It's the book Evangelism. Ellen White writes these words. Here they are on the screen for you. She says, house to house labor, searching for souls, hunting for the lost sheep is the most essential work that can be done. Most essential work. She says, house to house labor is the work that will make the preaching of the word a success. And then the last one, go ahead and go, go two forward. One more. She says this, God will guide them to the homes of those who need and desire the truth. 
And as the servants of God engage in the work of seeking for the lost sheep, their spiritual faculties are awakened and energized. Today, as you go out, may you sense the Holy Spirit going with you. Let's be the church. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, this morning, this afternoon, as we move forward on your mission, may you make divine conversations happen and divine appointments be set so that we can connect with people, the ones that need you the most. May today be the starting point of something powerful. May the Forest Lake Church continue to be the church. God, we love you and we can't wait to see you. In Jesus' name, amen.